Mm. Wow. All right, Acts chapter 7, verse number 43. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Father in heaven, Lord, please help us as we look at this tonight. Help us to be able to rightly divide this and understand from the scriptures what it says about this, Lord, and uh, to teach the truth about it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Stephen, he preaches against Israel's idolatry here. That's what happens. But you'll note that if a man's idol is preached against, he's not, and he's not willing to get right with God about it and lay it aside, he'll get angry. You know, he'll get angry about it. And Israel got very angry. These, this council of Israel got angry about what he said. Because you'll notice this is about the last part of his sermon. He said, he said, you know, uh, and they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol. This is the end of his, his history lesson. He's coming to the end of it. And he's explaining to them how they resisted God and, and what they've done. But if he has a religious spirit about him, a man like that, if he has ceremonies and types and shadows and the mitre and the uniform and all those other things, as Israel stated plainly over and over again that they were the children of Abraham, they'll get mad when their idolatry is called out because they were, were given the oracles of God. And they had the law of Moses. However, they perverted the law of Moses and they made the commands of God in effect. Even in the prophet Ezekiel's time, God took Ezekiel into the wall. And he showed them, remember Ezekiel chapter 8? He showed them all their abominations. What do you think those were? Exactly what, what Stephan is talking about here. When Stephan is preaching to them, he is explaining to them, God saw all your idols. And, and you did, Now, what people don't realize is Israel battled idolatry all the time. I mean, for their whole existence. When they went into Egypt, they learned idolatry into Egypt. That's where they learned it. I mean, that's where they perfected it anyway. Uh, it was perfected in them there. And then when they came out of Egypt and they're going through the wilderness, they never shook that off. They still held to that idolatry. And that's what he's talking about here. <clears throat> he's talking about in the wilderness. As they traveled in the wilderness, it really took them 40 years to shake off those idols and to go through suffering, and that generation had to die, and another generation had to rise up. You might think, well, they had to worship God the whole time they were in the wilderness. Oh, no, they didn't. That's not what Stephen said. That isn't what Stephen said they did. Some of them didn't worship God. So remember Ezekiel, when he took him into the wall, and he showed him all those things. Now, this type of thing, we're going to talk about the tabernacle of Moloch first, and then we're going to get into everything else, but uh, to the star of your God, Remphan. And this, and this makes some people mad, because if they like Israel, they get upset about this. But we'll get to that in a minute. But that star is not the star of David. It's not. You search the scriptures over, you won't find the star of David. It's not in there. Now, they call it the shield of David, some of them do. It's not the shield of David either. It had nothing to do with David. David didn't do any of that, right? But I'll show you where it does come from, where it did come from. And it represents many things. And you'll be able to see that tonight when we go through this. Stephen's history lesson was no different. He upset them. He takes them back to their idolatry and how they've always been stiff-necked and rebellious and hardened their hearts against the Holy Ghost. And ignored the word of God that was given to them. But he mentions two big idols that we need to talk about. One of those is the tabernacle of Moloch. Now, it's all the same thing, really. See, Satan doesn't care which wrapper you worship him in. Whatever he's wrapped in. He really doesn't care what it is. His kingdom doesn't care as long as it's not the God of the Bible. As long as you don't worship in spirit and in truth, he doesn't care what, what you wrap it in. You can call it Baal. You can call it Ashtaroth, right? You can, you can call it uh, Moloch. It really doesn't matter. They're pretty much all the same in, in that sense. From the same kingdom, anyway. From the same Satan's kingdom, Saint, Satan's world. But Moloch, the tabernacle of Moloch. So that's what we're going to start with first. We start out with this tabernacle of Moloch. Now, Stephanie, he is quoting from the Old Testament passage in Amos. So turn to Amos chapter 5. 
verse number 25, because this is where Stephen is, re he, this is where he's quoting from. He is speaking of this very specifically. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness 40 years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, and Chayun your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Now, if we stop there for a second, you might be thinking in your mind, well, I mean, they probably didn't really worship, like, a real God. Yes, they did. I'm going to prove to you tonight what I believe is that they worshiped that Moloch is a fallen angel. He's a beast. That's what he is. It's exactly what he is. And that's what they worshiped. That's who they worshiped, among others. And I think Moloch and Baal are the same. I think they are the same God. Okay, uh, now the passage in, in Acts chapter 7, verse number 42, a little different, but, but about the same. Yea, you took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your God, Remphan, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. See, the Lord says if you're going to worship Babylon, then you're going to go to Babylon, Right? And that's what God told him. If you're going to worship Babylon, if you're going to worship the gods of Babylon, the Assyrian gods of Babylon, if you're going to worship these fallen angels, if you're going to worship these people, well, the, these gods, then guess what? You can go there. And you can live in the midst of them. And I would carry you away to them. And that's exactly what God did. We first, we notice that Moloch and Molech, which is spelled a few different ways. Milcom also. And other ways his name is pronounced. And Baal as well. And Ashtaroth worship. Baal Ashtaroth worship, worship is the same thing as this hexagram that, that the Jews have. Let, let me just, that's a shortcut into, into before we get to the star of your God, Remphan. The Jews on their flag, that is nothing more than Baal and Ashtaroth worship. It's nothing more than, than the feminine and the, and the, and the masculine. It's nothing, it's nothing more than the, than, the, uh, than the two that meet in between. It's, it's the sex cult. That's what it is. It's, it's the magic. It's Aleister Crowley, the same thing Aleister Crowley taught. It's the same thing. Somebody's out there. It's the exact same thing. That's what it is. And that's what's taught. That's what's taught right there. Okay? So we'll get to that in a second, and I'll show you that. Now, I, I believe there's a connection to the Bible that shows that Moloch is none other than a devil or a host of the heavens, or a fallen angel. But in order to prove that, we have to first look at some phrases that are in the Bible. Now, the phrase host of heaven is 19 times in the Bible. What were they not supposed to do? Worship the host of heaven. They were not supposed to do that. Why? Because God said, you, don't, you worship me in spirit and in truth. You don't worship me in my creation with what I created. You don't worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is God blessed forever. No, you don't do that, right? But that's what they were doing. And those stars represented something. And the host of heaven did. And God said, no. Don't do that. But you know, the number 18, the 18th time that, this, that, it's, that the host of heaven is mentioned, you know that number 666, if you add those together? The beast, and Moloch is a beast. That number rec re uh, represents the beast, right? The devil is called a beast, that wicked old serpent. He's called many other things, but he's a beast. His kingdom is a beastly kingdom. And there are many heavenly beasts in the Bible, many of them. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse number 5, is where we see Moloch represented here. And them that worship the hosts of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and that swear by the Lord, and that swear by Malcolm. The hosts of heaven and Moloch, or Malcolm, whatever you want to call them, it's the same thing, the God of the Ammonites, same thing is listed with the host of heaven. Furthermore, we know the host of heaven are the stars and the planets, and all that worship was forbidden to do. 
and they worshiped the planets because they represented something in the stars. We know that the stars also are the angels of God. We know that from studying scriptures. And we know that in Deuteronomy 32, 16, the Bible says they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God. Now look at this. There's, there's something being taught to you here. Pay attention very closely. If you study word for word, you'll figure something out here. Look what's being said here. This verse wraps it all up in here. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. He likens devils and gods. What they worshipped was devils. Look what he said. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. So God abhorred that. He hated that. He saw that false worship, and he hated that worship. And he said, because of that worship, because of what you've done, that he would drive them away. Right? So Moloch, we have the hosts of heaven, we have gods, and we have devils. And they all explain the same thing. The star of your god, Remphan, and Moloch. They all represent the same thing. Leviticus chapter 8. I believe very, very plainly that they worshiped this false god or this fallen angel, Moloch. I, I believe they did. And I believe that he is a fallen angel, a beast of some sort, right? And that's exactly what he desired, blood. They desire blood. You know... Pastor Hoggard talked about, and I haven't listened to his full, I did listen to the full one, the first one he did here recently, but one of the things that he talked about, though, is this. He mentioned about the coming kingdom, what's going to happen, and everything like that, the, the Satan's kingdom and everything. He, he mentioned that, you know, there, these aliens, which I believe it's true, I believe they're devils, fallen angels, gods, right? That's what they are. And they're going to keep falling. The Bible says the stars of heaven shall fall. And it's coming. It's coming. He said it was going to happen, and it's going to happen. That's, those are the signs that we're going to see. See, we're going to know because we're going to, we know the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. And they're going to come to this earth. Well, listen, I think they're starting to fall. And I think, I think we're seeing that. I think you're going to see you're seeing it with these UFOs. I agree with that. But the one thing that I remember from all these alien movies that they said, we come in peace. But they're liars. Because Matthew 24 says it's when they say peace and safety, then cometh what? Sudden destruction. And that's what that kingdom is going to do. They're going to come under the guise of flatteries, and sudden destruction will follow. And that's how these gods work. That's, that's, that's the exact same thing. See, our God, Jesus Christ, he gave his blood for us. Moloch and Satan and that kingdom wants your blood. See the difference? God gave his only begotten son. Satan wants to take your son. Listen to me. Do you see that? God said, do not let your sons or your daughters pass through the fire. Why is that? Because God said, I never came into my mind to do that for you. Never did it enter my heart for you to do that. Why? Because I'm going to give my son for you. My son will die for you. Don't give your sons to the devil. Boy, that's a sermon, isn't it? Don't give your sons and daughters to the devil. Look what Leviticus chapter 8, verse number 21 says, And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Moloch, 
neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. God hates Moloch worship. He hates it. Moloch worship was to sacrifice children to the fire. Moloch worship was to make their children pass through the fire while they were alive. Now, many, many describe Moloch as a large apis bull of some sort, a beast, two-legged with his arms out and his belly full of fire, and the babies would be placed in his burning arms and would roll into the bosom of fire and kill them alive. Leviticus 20, verse number 2. Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel, that giveth any of his seed unto Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. And I will set my face against that man, and I will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given of his seed unto Moloch to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. You know how they defiled his sanctuary? See, these heads of Israel, they were doing this stuff behind the walls. They were running the little cabal behind the walls. That's what Ezekiel was telling you in Ezekiel chapter 8. That's what Jesus was telling you when he said, you're of the synagogue of Satan. That's what Jesus was saying. You bunch of devils, you're the synagogue of Satan. Because that's the worship they had. They had the Babylonian, Moloch, Assyrian worship. So God wasn't happy with that, obviously. God was angry with that. I will set my face against that man. He said. And against his family, and I will cut him off, and all that go a whoring after him to commit whoredom with Moloch from among their people. So Solomon, what does he do? Here's a king that's blessed by God. God visits Solomon twice. And I'm going to tell you what, you, gotta, it's a, you have a hard time with people because they're like, how in the world is, was Solomon saved? Well, he was. He repented, too. The end of his life. He saw the vanity of his life. Saul never repented. Solomon did. And God said he wouldn't remove his mercy from Solomon. But what happened? 1 Kings 1.17. 11.17, 17, sorry. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the abomination of the children of Ammon. So Solomon, he builds a hill. He builds that big, beautiful temple, right? Builds that big, beautiful temple. Then he builds a hill for Moloch. Well, he says, well, I built that big temple for God. So is it not a little one? Is it not a little one just to make the woman happy? Didn't work out well for him, did it? The kingdom was rent from him. There is more to Moloch worship that God hates and abhors and it's heathen religion. Worshiping of false gods or devils. It is abominable in God's sight. He hates it. But in 2 Kings 23.10, the Bible says, And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Moloch. So he defiles it. What does he do? He destroys it. But that name Tophet was con commonly supposed to be derived from tof or a drum, from the drums that were used to drown the cries of the children when they were made to pass through the fire to Moloch. You see, the drums of tof would play out so the fathers could not hear the cry of their children they made to pass through the fire, and they would not want to recant and deliver their children from it. The popular conception molded for English readers largely by Milton's Moloch, Horrid King, as described in Paradise Lost, book one is derived from the accounts given in the late Latin and Greek writers. Says this one writer, the account of which is Diodorus Siculus, gives in his history of the Carthaginian Cronus or Moloch. See, it's all the same. It doesn't matter what his name is. They're all a bunch of devils. <laughs> and they all want to steal life. The image of Moloch was a human figure with a bull's head and outstretched arms, ready to receive the children destined for sacrifice. The image of metal was heated red hot by a fire kindled within, and the children laid on its arms, rolled off into the fiery pit below in order to drown the cries of the victims. Flutes were played and drums were beaten, and mothers stood by without tears or sobs to give the impression of the voluntary character of the offering. 
That's horrid, is it? Because there was only a couple hundred that did that. There's, there's four million women a year that do it now. They deliver their babies to a fiery furnace. They pull it out, they suck its brains out, and they toss it into a fiery incinerator. And if you're near Planned Parenthood, you can smell it when the babies are burning. still happening happening more now and now it's it's govern government sanctioned yeah yeah and there's still a bunch of witches and they have bloodlust and they they want they want to kill and they they kill the innocent life cuz they're they're all a bunch of witches that run those places they are and they know it and that's why they hate us cuz we preach against it just like they hated this when it was preached against is it any different? It's just worse today than it was then. Because there was only a few. I mean, a few hundred. Here we have millions and have had. I mean, honestly, I don't agree with Social Security and those other programs that, that, that have hooked people, but, you know, 60 million babies? What do, you, do you wonder where the money is? Well, you killed your own. 60 million. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. But good King Josiah, he destroyed the Moloch worship there as best he could at his time. 2 Kings 23.10, he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom. That's where the giants were, by the way. The valley of the son of Hinnom. That's where the giants were, too. They're connected to that area too. That no man might make his son or his daughter pass through to pass through the fire to Moloch. And he took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the son. At the entering into the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain, which was in the suburbs, and burned the chariots of the son with fire. Does it make you wonder the chariots of the son? What was that? What are chariots? They made chariots to the son, right? Those are the angels. Spirits. That's right. Mm -hmm. See, they knew what they were doing. They know what these symbols are. They know exactly what these symbols are. And they know what they mean. They know what they do. They definitely do. And the altars that were on the top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, did the king beat down and break them down from thence and cast the dust of them into the brook Kidron. And the high places that were before Jerusalem, which were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption. What was that? The Mount that Solomon built, the Mount of Corruption, which Solomon the king of Israel had builded for Ashtaroth, the abomination of the Zidians, and for Chemosh. The, God, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the, the, the abomination of the children of Ammon, did the king defile. That was revival right there. He was breaking it all down, and he break in pieces the images. Now, this is important because I want you to understand something. This is, what, this is what Stephan is talking about when he talks about the star of your god, Remphan, the images that they had made and what they were doing, their worship. And he break in pieces the images and cut down the groves and filled their places with the bones of men. But his sons would rear up the same false Moloch worship again. Because that's what happened. After Josiah died, they raised up the tabernacle of Moloch again. Now, this is a quote from, I think it's the ISBA, International Students Bible Encyclopedia. I don't think it's out here. Yeah, it is. It's down there. It's this one. I don't know where my wallet is, but I know where that is. That's a little frustrating. Anyway, but uh, that's, that's, that's the quote that <laughs> comes from right there. Anyway, what he says is, while there's no grounds for identifying Yahweh with Moloch, there are good grounds for seeing a community of origin between Moloch and Baal. The name, the worship, and the general characteristics are so similar that it is natural to assign them a common place of origin in Phoenicia. The fact that Moloch worship reached the climax of its abominable cruelty in the Phoenician colonies of which Carthage was the center shows that it had found among that people a soil suited to its peculiar genius. 
Moloch worship. They got it from somewhere else. God never showed them that. Baal or Moloch, I believe, is the same false god. Now, let's talk about the star of Remphan, the star of David. That's what it is. You're going to see in, in, in some of the pictures that I show you here, um, and we'll go back and forth. Let me see how much I wrote on that. Oh, I did write a lot. Oh, good. Okay, good. Yep. Okay, good. The star of your God, Remphan, he says, figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Again, this infuriated them. They claimed only to worship Jehovah and follow the law of Moses, but this simply was not the truth. And the star that you see on the flag today of Israel, which we'll go to. Yay, yeah. Okay. Is this the star of David? Well, I don't think David had a star but uh, that, that is mentioned, but is this the star of David or is it idolatry? Look what it is. It's a hexagram. That's right. And the hexagram, I'm going to show you through these pictures, and I'm going to read you about some of these. I've got a lot to read here uh, for you, but I, I want you to understand kind of what, what the deal is here. If somebody tells you, now listen, this is the star of David. Well, how come nobody wondered, like, well, where did it come from? Like, I mean, why do you have a hexagram for you? For your flag, right? Why do we see this symbol in many religions? By the way, this is witchcraft. This is this is what's that? Yeah, the zodiac. Yeah, this that's what this is. This is okay. Is this the star of David? Is this is this right here? The star of David. Why is this star on the Masonic Temple? Because they're a bunch of Kabbalists. But what, why, is this, why is this on the Masonic Temple? Why does Rome use this symbol? This is the Roman Catholic symbol. I know, I'll get to that. Why, why, why is that there? Does it mean something? Of course it does. See, Israel is a wicked nation. They are ungodly. But the fact that they have the Star of David as the star does not mean that they are not Jews. The fact that they use a pagan symbol does not mean they are not Jews. Because Acts chapter 7, he rebuked them and they killed him for saying the same thing. The star of your God, Remphan. Well, that's exactly what they did. He said, well, that they can't possibly have got. Well, who said they're of God? That doesn't mean they're not Jews, though. That doesn't mean that, that they always had a problem with it. It's right here. Stephen didn't say, look, I just want you all to know you're not really Israel. That's not what he said to them. You're not really Jews. No, he just recognized that it was there. There's the vicar of hell. He's got it right there. Look. See it up there in his hat? That's the old pope. Well, they're all old, but this one's older. That's the evil emperor pope. It does. We're going to talk about that. Well, sort of. The Mormon temples have it. Now, you must understand one thing. Mormonism is nothing more than a cheap ripoff of the Masonic order. If you don't understand that, go back and listen to my series on Mormonism. Because Joseph Smith was a Masonic pimp. That's all he was. Astrological. Yeah, he had his little talisman. His mojo. I might go through all those on the on the broadcast and do those again. I think that'd be kind of fun. Seeing how I'm making friends and influencing people. That is on an Islamic mosque. Hey! Now, where did that come from? What's that doing there? That's not supposed to be there. I'm sure that must. Surely that is an accident, Aaron. 
That cannot be in the on a mosque, right? I mean, no way. Yeah, the Jews, they did it. So are you starting to see that? Well, what you have to understand is that symbol, there's a spirit behind it. There's a spirit behind it. That's why they all have it. Look at this. It is possible that a simple geometric shape, like, for example, the triangle, circle, or square, the hexagram has been created by various peoples with no connection to one another, but it's also possible that the knowledge of galaxy was spread from one direction. This six-pointed stars have also found in cosmological diagrams in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, the reasons behind the symbol's common appearance in Indic, Indic religions and the West are known, are unknown. Well, it's not unknown to us. We know. They're all a bunch of devils. That's why. One possibility is that they have a common origin. Well, duh. Where would that common origin be? I would think it would be the flood. And I would think Babylonian worship came from Babel. And I would think that symbol was there, and, it, and they carried it. And that's why it's everywhere in the world. This is called the Anahata, also known as the Anahata Puri. It's symbolized by a lotus flower with 12 petals. Yeah, 12. Isn't that something? Within Indic lore, the shape is generally understood to consist of two triangles, one pointed up and the other down, locked in harmonious embrace. Yep. The two components are called Om and Hrum in Sanskrit and symbolize man's position between earth and sky. The downward triangle symbolizes Shadki, the sacred embodiment of femininity, and the upward triangle symbolizes Shiva. Representing the focused aspects of masculinity. Same symbol, same place, same spirit. Right? As is above, so is below. Same Masonic symbol. Same thing. Okay, this is the, the Indic lore one I just told you about. See that little dude in the middle? Yep. The mystic symbols of Om and Hrim. Same spirit. Uh, in Buddhism, this is on a Buddhist temple. In Buddhism, some old versions of the Bardo Thodo, also known as the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is really creepy, contains a hexagram with a swastika inside. What? <laughs> How'd that happen? Clearly. It was made up by the publishers for the particular publication. In Tibetan, it is called The Origin of Phenomenon, and it is especially connected with the Vara Yogani and forms the center part of her mandala. In reality, it is in three dimensions, not two, although it may be portrayed either way. Many Western occultists associate this central chakra with the central sephira, the tephira, and the, Kabbalist, the Kabbalistic tree of life. Christian Kabbalist. There's no such thing. Thank you. <laughs> Christian Kabbalists in particular associate the Sephira with love, healing, and knowledge. Same symbol. Mm hmm. Yep, yep. Here we go. The Universal Jewish Encyclopedia declares the six pointed star, according to the Rosicrucian, was known to the ancient Egyptians. The six, okay, so this is, this is where we go back to Egypt, okay? We understand the same spirit. Babylon is a floating spirit, right? This goes anywhere. Right? It's the god, the god of this world. All right. So the six triangles is the Egyptian hieroglyphic for the land of the spirits. In the astro mythology, mythology of the Egyptians, we find belief in the first man god Horus and his death and resurrection as a Amzu. The six pointed star was the first sign of hieroglyphic of Amzu. Amzu, the risen Horus, was the first man god risen in spiritual form. A Jewish scholar, Professor Sholem, was the researcher of Kabbalah and Jewish mysticism and one of the founders of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, conducted a 50-year study into the history of the Star of David. He published a short summary of this study in 1949, shortly after the symbol was chosen to appear on the new state's national flag, where he stated, The Magin David is not a Jewish symbol and therefore not the symbol of Judaism. 
All in all, it goes to the king of Solomon, who was pagan, by the way. He fell deep into idolatry because he was unduly influenced by his pagan wives. So anyway, alchemy, the hexagram, right? All of it right there, among other things that you can imagine in those pictures. Crowley's, yep, he was, Crowley was an Egyptian mason, so he studied Egyptian. He was like a 100 degree, or what is it, Aaron, 100 and some odd degree, something, Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. That's why it looks like that. Wow. Yep. So the Encyclopedia Britannica says that the this identifies the six-pointed star as the magical sign of protection against evil spirits. It, it is only, it, which brings evil spirits, by the way. It is only in Jewish sources that the interlaced triangles are called the Shield of David as non-Jewish sources call the symbol the Seal of Solomon. What Solomon left behind was not only the division of the 12 tribes of Israel, but evidence of his idolatry. His foreign wives led him to worship of the goddesses Ashtaroth, which means a star and a common female name in Armenia, otherwise called Astarte, meaning star. The six-pointed star hexagram, which came to be called the Seal of Solomon, when King Solomon took it upon himself, was the chief article of this pagan worship. So, uh, but who were the foreign wives of King Solomon? Uh, and from whence they came, no one really knows about some of them. Anyway, they were the ones who changed the wheel of history, and they were the ones who brought pagan teachings. I don't believe that, but I believe they were around a lot longer than that. Now, this is the oldest, um, this is the oldest known depiction of a six-pointed star dating back to the third millennium. Yeah, it was excavated in the ash... Ashtarok burial mound in Nurkin Naver in Armenia. This was confirmed by a series of radiocarbon analysis of artifacts conducted in laboratories in Germany and the U.S. The handle of a dagger depicts the world's earliest decoration of a six-pointed star buried in a burial mound containing over 500 graves. Same symbol. These symbols, what's that? Yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? These symbols survive, don't they? Armenians were skilled mathematicians architects, and craftsmen. In ancient times, the Armenians had a refined knowledge of astronomy and were able to predict astral events. The observatory of Metz Mor allowed ancestral Armenians to develop geometry to such a level they could measure distances, latitude, and longitude, envision the world as round, and were predicting solar and lunar eclipses about a thousand years before the Egyptians began to do the same. Armenian architecture is often geome geome geometrically sound with, with straight lines, connecting columns and mathematical precision. The geometry of the Armenian architecture has stood the test of time by preserving many ancient buildings in a region dominated by war, poverty, and natural disaster. So they knew what they were doing. I would think so. Or did you say, the yeah, the third millennium. Yeah, 2700, yeah, something like that, yeah. Because the flood was what, at like 2800 or something like that, 2700, or was it close to 4000? No, 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 no. It was, yeah. W yeah. So, yeah, it was right around this time. That's when it would have been, yeah. The Dome of the Korakert Monastery, Armenia. See the symbol? Same one. This is not a Hebrew, Israelite, biblical symbol. It's a pagan one. It was the star of their god, Remphan. Theosophical Society. Hey, what's Prince's symbol doing in there? Oh, wait, that's an onk, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's the Nazi symbol up there before the Nazis were cool. You see that? Yeah, do you see the symbol up above? Yeah, that's the theosophy. Yeah, there's the snake. There's the coiled up snake. I didn't even see that. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is interesting. This is Saturn. That's on Saturn. Yes, it is. And, and yeah, it is. It's actually there, and they can't figure out why it's there. They have no clue why it's there. 
But those, how did those people know? Because what you have to understand is what we're going to show you, what I'm going to show you or talk to you about a little bit is the fact that that yeah, the devils do know. That's right. But here's the thing you have to understand. It's Saturn worship. All of this is Saturn worship. Saturn is the sixth planet. Okay? It's the number six. And it's the one that, it's the one that they worshipped. Okay, Remphan. So let's talk a little bit about Remphan. You've seen the symbol. I wanted to show you the different symbols, how it was in every single one of those false religions. They all held to that same symbol. Why? Because it represents their God. It represents the God of this world. It represents his kingdom. It represents what's coming. And what is that? Daniel chapter 2, verse number 43. What are, the, what, what are the Masons hiding? What is their secret? The generative principle. What were the sons of God and the daughters of men doing? What were they doing? Right. What were, that's what they were doing. So what are they, who, what, what, who is the light of the lodge? Lucifer. Who are they waiting for? Who is Israel going to crown king? The Antichrist. Who are they waiting for? Who, is, who are the Muslims waiting for? Right. Who are the Buddhists and everybody else? Who are they all waiting for? That one that is to come. Right. The ascended master. Who are they all waiting for? The one that's to come. And what does that symbol show you? That's him. Now, I personally think the Bible spells it out better than anything Ever when it says this, that that kingdom in Daniel 20, uh, chapter 2, verse number 43, is going to come down and mingle itself with the seed of men. And that's the Antichrist. He's going to be the lie. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, who is Rem, Rem fan? Uh, let's see. Let me read you this a little bit. Again, this would infuriate them. Let's see, talk about that. There can be no doubt that we should vocalize Kiwan, the Assyrian, by which at least in late Babylonian Saturn was indicated. Saturn worship. That symbol being on Saturn was remarkable, wasn't it? The passage in Amos, by the way, that's from a satellite that picked that up. That went by there. That, yeah, that, yeah. The passage in Amos refers to the Saturn worship, which appears to have been in vogue in the prophet's day. Chiyun is the Saturn worship. That's what it is. Remphan, the Syriac translates it by Saturn, whom the Sh Shemitic uh, nations are known to have, who have worshipped. But it apparently is not a proper name at all, being derived from the root uh, to stand upright, and therefore signifies simply a statue or idol, as the Vulgate renders it in connection with the following words. So this is from a dictionary. The same is probably true of the word Rendered Moloch in the sense. So anyway, you bore the tabernacle of your king. So Moloch, it means the great king. It means a great king. Who's the Antichrist going to be? A king of fierce countenance. So all of the, just as all those things point to Christ and picture him, all of these things, they're waiting for their God to come. Yeah, they're waiting for him to come. They're waiting for a beast. And they're going to get it. So we see that th there's, a, there's a calf as well that's talked about uh, there. Uh, let's see. Which, let's see. Let me go back here. The same is probably true with the word Moloch in the same passage. So that the whole may be translated, uh, you bore the tabernacle of your king and the statue of your idol. So anyway, he's, he's you know, we don't care about his non-King James stuff. But anyway, uh, <laughs> calf. As a star is mentioned, it has naturally been inferred that the worship of some planet is alluded to. And this Jerome supposed to be Lucifer or Venus. Layard thinks the name identical with that of the Egyptian goddess Ken figured on the Egyptian and Assyrian monuments of the character of Astarte to Venus, or Venus. But he admits that her worship was borrowed from Assyria into Egypt at a period later than the Exodus. On the whole, the above supposition that the planet Saturn is intended is the most plausible, although this interpretation cannot be successfully defended merely from the name itself in the form of Chium or Remphan. The Kabbalist, they use the symbol as a protection against evil spirits. So the Jewish Kabbalists use that symbol, and that's on the flag of Israel. 
Let that sink in a little bit. And let it sink in that all the nations of the earth are going to turn to idolatry. They're going to turn to that false god that's going to come. In the 17th century, it became popular to practice a pra- popular practice to put Mage and David, the, sh- the shield of David, on the outside of Jewish synagogues to identify them as Jewish houses of worship, in much the same way that a cross identified the Christian house of worship. The so-called Star of David gained popularity as a symbol of Judaism when it was adopted as the emblem of the Zionist movement in 1897. But the symbol continued to be very controversial for many years. When the modern state of Israel was founded in 1948, there was much debate over whether this symbol should be used on the flag. Because of its geometric symmetry, the hexagram has been a popular symbol in many cultures from the earliest times. A Masonic book called The Second Mile, an Eastern Star book, reveals that the six-pointed star is a very ancient symbol and one of the most powerful. The hexagram is used in magic, witchcraft, sorcery, and occultism, and the casting of the zodiacal horoscopes by astrologers. Anthropologists claim that the triangle pointing downward represents female sexuality and the triangle pointing upward, male sexuality. Thus, their combination symbolizes unity and harmony. In alchemy, the two triangles symbolize fire and water. Together, they, rec- they represent the reconciliation of opposites, which we know the world is waiting for those gods to come. So if you think of Baal and Ashtaroth worship, you think of the same thing. That's what it is. It's that sacred feminine versus that masculine. It's what they worshipped. That's why they got in trouble all the time. Israel did. How did the Jews steal? This, this guy wrote this. How did the Jews steal the hexagram star of Ishtar? Well, he ain't lying. I wouldn't agree with him on a lot of things, the man who wrote this, but he's not lying about that. He's an Assyrian, and he says, hey, you stole the star of Ishtar from us. I don't think he's lying. The hexagram, the six-pointed star known among archaeologists as the Star of Ishtar, was used first as a symbol of worship for the Sumerians, and then the Babylonians, and was found in most of the civilizations that, follow, civilizations that followed. It existed in the Ugarart civilization of the Canaanites and Phoenicians, who had it as a symbol of the morning star or Venus. Yeah. And also in the Ar- Ar- Aramean and the Egyptian civilization. So all of these have the, and what did God say when they, do you remember what God said when they left? When they left Egypt, what did God say to them? Or when they, God pulled them Egypt, don't you do what they did there. And don't you worship me with symbols. Don't you worship me with these symbols, and don't you worship me, and don't you try to make a figure of me, and don't you do it, make a graven image of me. I'm going to get to some scripture here, but don't you do that, because you can't do that. Acts 17, 29, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Don't make some symbol of me like that. So he goes on to say, for our history, the Assyrians, it is one of the most famous philosophical and spiritual symbols of the Syrian heritage. The hexagram is composed of two cross triangles. The triangle with its base at the top and its peak or head downward represents the divine quest to manifest itself in human beings. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. The gods that came down? Yeah. Yeah. And it's the same symbol. It's the same religion. Right. Oh, that's right. Those Sumerian texts, right? Those old ones, those tablets. They're really super old. I mean, they still have some of them, right? Right. Right. Downward represents the divine quest to manifest itself in human beings. So they're saying that downward, that's the divine quest to manifest in the man. I mean, it's pretty, pretty clear, isn't it? The triangle with its base at the bottom and its peak upwards represents the human quest for the annihilation, 
for the annihilation of the divine, and their intersection represents the Savior. Who's their Savior? The Antichrist. The hexagram appears in many houses, he says, churches and mosques in old Damascus, because it has an elegant artistic and philosophical presence. In the Syrian civilization, before Arab and Islam, and then in the Arabic and the Islamic inscriptions, it was called the Star of Wisdom for its profound philosophical and spiritual implications. In the Ugarit civilization, the triangle whose head is downward symbolizes femininity, and the triangle whose head is upward symbolizes masculinity, and the intertwining of the triangles gives birth to life. Yep. We do not, we do not worship God in symbols, though. Deuteronomy 7, 5, what did God say? He said, but thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars. Break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Verse number 25, he says, The graven images of their God shall ye burn with fire. Thou shalt not desire the silver or gold that is on them, nor take it unto thee, lest thou be snared therein. For it is an abomination of the Lord thy God. Neither shalt thou bring an abomination to thine house, lest thou be a cursed thing like it. But thou shalt utterly detest, and thou shalt utterly abhor it. For it is a cursed thing. The six-pointed star is commonly used both as a talisman and for conjuring spirits and spiritual forces in diverse forms of occult magic. In the book, The History of the Practice of Magic, Volume 2, the six-pointed star is called the Talisman of Saturn. And it is also referred to as the Seal of Solomon, which is by the Masonic Order, right? So you have all these ancient mystery Babylon religions that use the star of your god, Remphan. They use the hexagram. Why would God's people... I know they're not because they're not saved, but why would the nation of Israel, why would they use that symbol? Well, the answer is very clear because they're Kabbalistic and they're pagan. That doesn't make them any less Israel. It just makes them idolatrous and wicked and what Stephen warned them about. It doesn't mean they don't have a right to exist in that sense or anything like that either. What it means is that they're pagan. That, and that symbol is pagan. And there's a spirit behind that symbol. And it is not a spirit of righteousness. Yep. No, it was already there. Solomon's wives got him to, got him to build, you know, the, that hill of corruption or whatever, that he did those extra things for them. But that worship was already in there. It wasn't prevalent in the time of David because of David's strong stand for the Lord. Well, they knew from Genesis chapter 3. See, Satan knows the Bible, and he knows that Jesus was going to come and die on the cross. He knew that. He understood that there was going to be redemption. So all of those stories that mock creation, or I mean, that, that mock the incarnation of Christ, all of them are designed to make the truth look like a lie, and the lie to look like the truth. And see, what we have now are basically people that are waiting. They're going to be deceived just like Eve was deceived. Eve was told that she could live forever in this flesh. There's only two ways to live forever. Christ saves your soul. You die, and you live with him forever for all of eternity. Or a false transformation that is a lie that will end up in the, you'll end up in the lake of fire. But what will, they, what will they offer you to live in the flesh? That's Satan's transformation. That's his subtlety. That's his deceit. Right, and that's his deceit. See, here's the thing you have to ask yourself, and, and Hoggard brought this up too, which is a good point. In his video, he said, well, what if they came to you and told you that 
you know, if we just rewrite your DNA, if we just do it, I mean, we could take all your cancer away. Right? For your wife. What do you do? What do the aliens come and they and they provide their mark? Because the technology and everything that we have, it's not of this world. It isn't. We don't have time to get into that, but it's just, it's not of this world. It was given. And they know it. Yep. Alchemy, all of it. Yeah, and pull it back and bring it in. They are. Yep. And they're trying to they're trying to make it another way. But that's what's going to be appealing cuz the antichrist is going to offer the world the lie. And just like that, what was the name of that guy? Oh man, the one the transformation video I did. On Friday, Peter 2.0, like that guy, he doesn't want to suffer. And Ray Kurzweil and all those others, they don't want to suffer. Not yet, but it's coming quick. Maybe quicker than what we realize, but that's why we have to be ready, amen? Be born again by the Spirit of God. Be saved by the grace of God. Have your sins forgiven. The Lord is merciful. He's long-suffering and patient. Amen. It's coming, right? It's coming. But anyway, so this gives you an idea of, of exactly what that star is and the fact that it's not, it's not the star of David. David had nothing to do with that, all right? He, he had nothing to do with that. So people, this, those that worship the nation of Israel and can't tell them, they, can't say they ever did anything wrong, can't handle that type of teaching. But it's just the truth. It's very plainly truthful. That's where it came from. There's nothing in the Bible about having a star of David, a hexagram. But there is, well, actually there is. It's the star of their God, Rem fan. That's exactly where it is. It's in there, but it's not positive. Yes. Well, they had some religious ceremonies, and they were fornicating type ceremonies. And that's how he drew the people away. He drew them away with the princes. What's that? Yeah, but it's the same spirit. It's the same spirit. See, what they learned in Egypt, they took with them, a lot of them. And when they got into the wilderness and Balaam tempted them, Balak did with the women, those were ceremonies. But when Moses came down from the mount and they had the apis bull, that wasn't an accident in Exodus 32. That's not an accident. They made that God. They made it, they formed it, that image of that God. That was an image. That golden, that, that, the golden um, calf was an image. It was the apis bull God. It's probably Moloch or whatever, Baal, whatever, but that's the same God. Right, and then they made the two calves in the entering of the way. So they always had a problem with that. Yeah, they, they always had a problem with it. But there's a spirit behind the symbol. Now you see the spirit. You see it everywhere. It's in all those religions. It's the same thing. It's in there. You know. Father, Lord, we thank you for the truth. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you that we can understand it and rightly divide it by the spirit of God. Lord, we just pray you. Bless us now and bless this week, Lord, as we finish it up for you. Help us with our evangelism in the weekend. Help us get many tracks out. Help all the printing equipment to work well. Please just continue to bless your work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.